Happy Wednesday, everyone. Yesterday, you began studying our next concept, um, an idea that seems simple enough on the surface, the idea of money. You began by watching a selection from a video called The Ascent of Money about the interaction between the Incas and Pizarro. And if nothing else, what should, that should prove to you about this idea of money is it's much more complex than it appears on the surface. Take the Incas. For their sake, from their perspective, they couldn't really comprehend why the Spanish would want so much gold and silver. To them, wasn't there a limit to how much pretty metal um, a people could want or desire? From the Spanish perspective, they failed to comprehend the implications of acquiring so much money, and in fact, it became one of the things that helped to bring about the fall of their empire. So what that should tell us is this idea of money has never been simple. And let me start with a very simple question for you. Imagine we're face to face and I walk up to you in class and I ask a very simple question. How much money do you have? How would you answer that? My experience is when I ask people, how much money do you have in class? Their first response to say, do you mean like on me? And my sense is when they ask that, they're thinking about this. They're thinking about the dollar bills and coins that they carry in their purses or their wallets. And that's a totally viable answer. So some people might think in that way. And other people tend to follow that up with like, do you mean like what I have in a checking account? That's also a totally viable answer. Um, makes complete sense because the money in your checking account in a bank is money. For some people though, they might go further and they might say, do you mean what I have in like a savings account? That also would be a totally viable answer to this idea of money. So once again, even the simple question of how much money do you have um, demonstrates that it's a little bit more complex than appears on the surface. The emphasis today will be not only on what is money, but this question of the money supply or the question of how much money is there and beyond that, why does it matter? Um, as a quick review from yesterday, um, when you read section 27.1, it tried to provide you with a definition of money. And I wanna make sure we spend just a few moments going back over that. First thing I wanna note is that in the definition that we're working with here, it says that money is anything that can be used for any of these purposes. So again, this piece of paper can serve as money. Um, numbers in a digital account can serve as money. A plastic gift card with information on it can be money. Uh, paper checks can be a form of money. So really anything could be money. In the video that you watched yesterday, gold was money, clay was money, numbers running across a computer screen, screen are all money. So basic ideas here once again are that money is anything that can be used as a medium of exchange, meaning it can make it just easier for buyers and sellers to interact. That way when one farmer that is raising carrots interacts with a farmer that is raising cattle, they don't have to figure out exactly how many carrots a cow is worth. They can use dollars to represent the difference um, or the comparison between the two, and it makes it easier to buy and sell goods. Uh, money is anything that can be used to kind of store something's value. And what I mean by that is take the case of a carrot farmer. Carrot farmer raises 10,000 pounds of carrots uh, once a year. They work all spring and summer to get ready for harvest. They harvest it and they've got a mountain of 10,000 pounds of carrots. The problem for them is they have to make these carrots in a sense last until the next harvest. Not because they're going to eat them, but because they are going to try to sell them off. Well, over the course of a year, those carrots are going to rot. They're going to decompose and they're going to become worthless. If, however, that farmer can exchange those carrots for a whole bunch of these, then these can be used throughout the course of the year to buy other goods and services that they need. So money helps to act as a store of value. It also acts as, as a unit of account. It's simply a number, a way to track values, to compare um, values of different things. Here's where Wyatt Vint, you get the shout out for turning your $100,000 in our stock market game into nearly $190,000, I think now. Again, I'm using the words dollars but you're not actually getting the physical currency. It's reflecting how much value you have in the stock market at this point. So money is another way to um, account for values. And the fourth of these was a standard of deferred payment. 
if I go into a car dealership and I want to buy an $80,000 new automobile, which I definitely can't afford, but if I wanted to, I could promise to pay them in the future and drive off the lot today with this. There's an understanding between the um, dealership and myself that I'll be paying in dollars in the future. So again, it allows for this idea of credit to take place. So now the question about the money supply, the question of why exactly does how much money there is matter? Well, as you watched in the Ascent of Money yesterday, this was one of the things that the Spanish failed to account for in their conquering of various parts of uh, South America and <clears throat> North America. <coughs> Excuse me. So consider the Spanish um, and consider the graph on the left here. This is a simple supply and demand graph. And let's consider that this graph is in the market for money itself. So what we see as the Spanish mined more gold and more silver, they increase the supply of money. So we have a shift to the right, but the effect of that is that a new equilibrium is created, which drives down the price of money, or another way to express that is it drives down the value. The gold and silver that they found as they found more of it became worth less. So what we find is that when there are increases in the supply of money, it leads to a decrease in the value of that money. So that's what we commonly refer to as inflation. Um, inflation people also define as an increase in the overall prices. Both are um, proper ways to explain the idea of deflation. Let's take a uh, look at the graph on the right. Um, let's go back to the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, there were massive amounts of banks that collapsed. People had put their money into the banks, um, deposited it there, and when the banks collapsed, the money that they thought they had just simply no longer existed. It was no longer there. So what we saw take place during the Depression was a decrease, relative decrease, in the supply of money. And we can see here on the graph as the supply of money decreases, that the price of that money or the value of that money increases. So that sounds really good. Um, an increase in prices, sorry, in the price of money, in the value of money, means that it takes fewer dollars or fewer or less of that money to buy those goods and services, which is great if you can, um, if you happen to have that money, that's wonderful. However, however, if you are somebody who's trying to sell your goods and services for that money, that means you're getting less of that. And that's what we call deflation, an increase in the value of money and inversely, um, a decrease in the value of prices. So the amount of money that's in circulation um, has a great impact. And again, it helped to bring down the Spanish Empire. So when I asked you how much money you had earlier, um, my guess was you were going to be thinking about money in a couple of different ways. The cash, your checking account, savings accounts. So when we try to consider how much money is out there, we understand that there are different kinds of money. So we're going to focus here on that, this idea that there are two different kinds of money. Very simple terminology. They're referred to um, as M1 and M2. M1 refers to any kind of financial assets that people have where they can easily use it to buy and sell or to buy goods and services with. So going back to a term from, from our the beginning of the unit, the idea of liquidity. M1 is money that is a high degree of liquidity. So the money that you carry around in your pockets, the cash and the coin, has a high degree of liquidity, so it's part of M1. Your checking accounts, and or, your, or if you have a debit card, I'm trying to cover up my um, the number on the card, um, most places that I go to accept this, and it's readily accepted as a form of payment. So the money that I have in the checking account, that's considered part of M1 as well. Um, on the flip side, I also have money in a savings account. I can't go into Target and just buy a roll of toilet paper with my savings account. And it's not just because there's a shortage, they just don't accept money from a savings account. It's not that difficult for me to transfer from a savings account to a checking account and then use the checking account, but it makes it more cumbersome to buy and sell, to, to buy goods and services. So savings accounts are part of what are called M2. What defines money as M2 is they're assets that cannot be used directly to purchase goods and services. Sometimes it's referred to as near money. 
Now, incorporated as part of M2 is also M1, so it's a wider measurement of how much money there actually is. So included in that are savings accounts, um, things that are called CDs, it stands for Certificate of Deposits, in which you can essentially lend your money to a banking institution for a set period of time, six months, a year, two years, they will pay you interest back, but for that time period, you can't really access that money. It is yours, but you can't use it to buy goods and services with. And then there are other different kinds of accounts that people can hold where you, again, can't really use it directly to buy goods and services, but it is money. It is real. You just can't use it. It's not nearly as liquid as money in M1. To give you a little bit of a picture here of what this looks like, what you see here on the right is a comparison of how much money was in circulation. Um, this is from 2015, so things have changed, but the general pattern remains the same. If you look at the amount of currency, that would be your cash and coin, that's in circulation as of 2015, that would be uh, $1,271 billion or $1.2 trillion. Uh, we have our demand deposits. Those are kind of your checking accounts that you can use to directly buy things. There we have about $1.7 trillion worth. If you add up all of your M1 at the time, we're getting around $3 trillion in highly liquid money. If we look down here, though, the total amount of M2 or the money that we have that is not easily used to buy and sell goods and services with, there's a much larger amount. And I don't know this, but I'm guessing if I, if I were to ask you, do you have more M1 or M2? Um, maybe you guys are a little bit different, but most people don't have big, giant, fat stacks of cash laying around. They tend to have their money elsewhere in ways that they can't really access it as quickly as cash or in a checking account. So if we look at what makes up M2, we see this would be $7 trillion in savings accounts. We have other kinds of, <clears throat> of accounts that, once again, are kind of locked in for a period of time or aren't really accessible to use to purchase goods and services with. So there's far more money that can't be directly used to buy and sell goods and services with. Sorry for the pause. Um, the last thing I want to start to introduce, because you're going to be working with this over the next um, couple of weeks, is the United States in 1913 created what was called the United States Federal Reserve Bank. It's often referred to as the Fed. Uh, when people say the Fed, that doesn't mean the federal government. That means the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, they are na the nation's central bank, and one of their functions is to try to moderate the amount of money in circulation to make sure that there's not too much of it, to make sure there's not too little, so we don't have massive spikes in prices called inflation, and we don't have collapses in prices called deflation. So going forward, you're going to hear a lot about the Federal Reserve, what it does, how it does this as an attempt to moderate the money supply.